friends in the series which we are doing on the making of contemporary India from 1950 to 1990s. Today we will talk about the left parties and Naxal Bari and Naxal Bari movement became quite popular in that sense uh, during that period when it emerged and how the issues of a particular section of people they got reflected in the Naxal Bari movement. And there is a lot of debate in, in the later times as well that uh, the people those who were in a way deprived or they felt disadvantaged at a certain point of time uh, because of which they rose in some kind of an uprising uh, against the state as well and how some of the political parties uh, they supported uh, this uh, kind of a, a movement at that point of time. Uh, before we discuss the movement, uh, we can refer to some of the readings, Bipin Chandra's India after independence, uh, Ram Chandra Guha's India after Gandhi, uh, Parth Mukherjee study of social conflicts, case of Naxal Bari peasant movement, Sumant Banerjee in wake of Naxal Bari a history of Naxalite movement in India. Indian Express, Naxal Bari, how a peasant uprising triggered a pan-India political movement. Uh, Hindu, uh, Naxal Bari, Bengal village where 50 years of a movement is celebrated. So, these are some of the readings which one can refer when one is talking about uh, the Naxal Bari movement and uh, the after effects of uh, the Naxal Bari movement as it has been suggested that how the Naxalite movement it uh, developed. Uh, out of uh, this kind of uh, an uprising which began at Naxal Bari. And in that sense, uh, we will find that how the different political parties uh, which were there after independence, be it Congress or the left parties in which we have the Communist Party of India. And they had their own differences in that context. And thereafter, uh, we see that how Communist Party of India because of their own differences. In 1964, mm, they parted ways uh, where one party became the Communist Party of India and another party became known as the Communist Party Marxist or CPM. So, when uh, we tend to understand, uh, when we tend to understand CPM, then we find that it felt that the Indian state uh, was the organ of the class rule of bourgeoisie and the landlords. And it was also led by the big bourgeoisie who are increasingly collaborating with the foreign finance capital. And they were critics of uh, the Congress that how they saw Congress as the chief instrument of the ruling classes and how Congress uh, had to be destroyed in the long run. So, uh, we find that how uh, they saw that the landlords and the bourgeois uh, section uh, they were in a way uh, were their enemies and they had to in a way turn the order in that way that both these sections uh, be it uh, the uh, the landlords or the bourgeois uh, they had to give way uh, to the more common classes be the peasants or the working class. And uh, they also felt that uh, uh, at that point of time it was it, it 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 could be seen that the way situation was unfolding in india so their uh, goal in that sense uh, uh, was uh, to create that kind of a movement uh, where indian constitution they saw that it was inherently anti democratic and uh, cpm did not believe that its goal of establishing a peoples uh, democratic state uh, could be established through peaceful and the parliamentary means. So, it uh, was in, in it was wanting some kind of uh, violent kind of a movement and uh, they felt that the constitution could be used uh, as an instrument of struggle and how uh, they can try to break it from within. So, they wanted to bring about revolution uh, in the social relations and uh, they had to start it was very very necessary or essential to start an agrarian revolution and uh, an armed struggle under the leadership of uh, the working class and the party was also essential this is what they believed and uh, 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 they also felt that uh, the party would try to create uh, suitable conditions for an armed struggle 
as soon as possible because at that point of time they believed that conditions were not suitable for them and uh, they would use uh, participation in the parliamentary politics uh, to create these kind of conditions and to overcome the illusions that people still had regarding the usefulness of the parliament uh, and the constitution. So, in that sense uh, their ideological position was such that they were just trying uh, or they, were, they, they, they just wished to use the constitution to further their own ends uh, when the situation is ripe uh, for that kind of a revolution which they had in their own uh, mind and in the setup. And uh, we find that uh, in terms of challenges that how CPI was also not able to work out full and real implications of a civil libertarian and uh, democratic society. And it uh, repeatedly bogged down uh, with problems posed in the abstract such as revolutionary versus non-revolutionary path, uh, violent versus non-violent means, parliamentary work versus armed struggle. So, the kind of challenges which were there in the context of uh, CPI, uh, they were not able to work out in that sense and many a times uh, how they got bogged down with the kind of problems in terms of abstract as I told you that they were thinking in terms of those lines which, I, which uh, have been communicated earlier whether in the framework of uh, the revolutionary versus the non-revolutionary path, which kind of path with which they should take whether they should follow the violent means or whether they should follow uh, the non-violent means, whether they must adhere to the parliamentary work or they should engage themselves in some kind of an armed struggle. So, these were some the, of the challenges which were there and the real problems they, that was, no, was not posed that what did it mean to be a social revolutionary in the context of uh, the post independent democratic India and uh, electoral and parliamentary politics were not to be encompassed by a traditional communist uh, notion of using them as mere fo forums of propaganda and as measures of communist strength. So, uh, the kind of major or the real problem you know, that was not being enco encountered and uh, they had to see that kind of a situation. Uh, because the way situation was uh, unfolding in those times and uh, they, had, they had to also in a way adapt to the post independent democratic India or uh, the society. Uh, they could not just have their own ideas not keeping in mind uh, the wishes of the large majority of people which were being expressed uh, through the elections uh, through the democratic process by which uh, uh, by casting their votes, uh, they were uh, deciding the Indian political discourse in terms of electing the governments. So, uh, we find that uh, uh, these kind of divisions they occurred in the political parties and especially Communist Party of India, uh, because the, the kind of path which they uh, chose or they were not able to uh, adopt uh, positive and a politically viable attitude towards the idea of nation building because the idea of a nation building was an important concern in the society of 1950s and the uh, ideas of nation building and the reformist measures which were initiated at this point of time and the way the policies of the government uh, they were also being uh, communicated or the, they, they were being implemented at different levels. So, uh, they, they were not able to have that, that kind of a proactive or a positive approach towards these kinds of measures. And uh, CPI functioned in a centralized bureaucratic and basically uh, secret party structure and how it was relying on the whole time party cadres. Uh, also did not suit a democratic and the open society. So, uh, when we tend to understand the structure of the political party especially CPI, then we, we will also find that it was a centralized kind of a secret party structure and uh, uh, it was not in a way uh, suitable for a democratic and open kind of a society uh, which India had become after 1947 
uh, when India became independent. Though they there might be certain kinds of uh, problems after independence in different spheres, but one also has to realize that India was in the incipient stage and India had just become independent. So, it was grappling with uh, a lot of challenges and through continuous efforts of the government as well as uh, the society or uh, the masses. Uh, India could evolve into a great nation and that was the objective of the people as well as uh, the people those who were associated with the ideas of nation building as well. And uh, if uh, we tend to understand that uh, such a party they could not hope to develop the mass uh, institutions and the mass power if they will behave in uh, uh, such a fashion. And uh, uh, when we uh, talk that uh, these kinds of differences uh, which were there and because of uh, these differences the party split uh, into CPI and CPIM uh, and uh, how uh, because of uh, such kind of splits uh, we find that pa party also got weakened and uh, thereafter how in 1967 elections how they participated and they uh, formed a coalition government in the West Bengal uh, with uh, Bangla Congress with Jyoti Basu, CPM leader becoming uh, the Home Minister. So, this uh, also created this kind of a schism, schism or uh, some kind of a dis uh, division uh, in the party and it was not uh, good for the party in the uh, long run and then we find that how uh, section of uh, the party uh, with young carders, how they got influenced by the cultural revolution in China and uh, uh, how they were trying to see party in that sense and they felt that uh, a party should follow uh, that kind of a structure which was there. And on the other hand, there were others, those who were not uh, trying to toe that kind of a line and they argued that the party must uh, immediately initiate uh, the armed peasant insurrections in the uh, rural areas. So, they uh, they were in a sense uh, trying to follow that kind of a, an approach which was more revolutionary in nature and how uh, gradual extension of the armed struggle uh, to the entire country that should also happen. And to implement their political line rebel CPM uh, leaders they launched a peasant uprising in small Naxalbari area of northern West Bengal. And uh, we find that in May 1967 in Naxalbari in northern part of the West Bengal, uh, it uh, attracted a lot of attention with an armed peasant uprising which was led by the pro Mao communist revolutionaries who were till then active members of the Communist Party of India Marxist. So, we find that how the people those who were associated with the Naxalbari movement, the peasants of the Naxalbari who were working on the tea plantations and uh, at the large estates uh, in those times uh, for a number of centuries they had been working there. And how these people they had been exploited by the land owning classes and the money lenders. And uh, this uh, kind of an exploitation by uh, by the elite section, the people those who had the resources in their own hands. And uh, so, this uh, kind of a thing it happened in 1967 and uh, we find that when uh, one of the sharecroppers in, in the village he tried to till the land from which he had been illegally evicted, uh, the landlord got him brutally beaten up and his belongings were taken away. So, exasperated by the exploitation of the landlords, the pe peasants across villages they got together and they rose in rebellion on March 25, 1967. So, uh, this is the kind of uh, situation uh, uh, which uh, was uh, some sort of a trigger point in terms of the rising of uh, the peasant society or the community. And uh, we find that that before that also uh, before 1967 uh, the kind of seeds of revolution or rebellion in the Naxalbari areas they were being nurtured by uh, the cadres of the communist party of India Marxist 
and uh, and also a uh, splinter group from the communist party of which was a splinter group from the communist party of india and uh, uh, we find that uh, cpi m was convinced that a real socialist revolution was possible only when the workers and the peasants uh, they would launch an uh, armed uprising against the moneyed classes and after the incident uh, march incident at naxalbari they were convinced that the movement had arrived the mo the movement had arrived so uh, they they were feeling that uh, because of the kind of prevailing situation uh, socialist revolution was possible and how the workers as well as the peasants they had to come together and how they had to in a way fight uh, the moneyed classes and when this ha uh, this incident happened after that they realized that they had to uh, undertake uh, uh, such kind of an exercise uh, where uh, they will be able uh, to uh, deal with the situation in a manner in which they anticipated in the earlier times where they they had this kind of a situation in mind that an armed rebellion uh, would be carried out to bring about the desired change and uh, when we tend to understand the people those who were associated uh, with this kind of a movement charu mazumdar was uh, one of the leaders of cpim and he believed that there was an excellent revolutionary situation in the country uh, with all the classical symptoms and other two key leaders were kanu sanyal and jangal santhal and they launched this uh, peasant uh, uprising in the naxalbari area so we find that uh, the cpm leadership uh, in it immediately expelled the rebel leaders that how the uh, uh, the left wing adventurism which was being used by them and how they were using um, the party organization and the government machinery uh, that was also being used and uh, to suppress the naxalbari insurrection so we find that the people uh, that the party also did not ascribe to it and uh, the breakaway cpm leaders uh, they were they came to be known as the naxalites and they were soon joined by the other similar groups uh, from cpm in the rest of country so we see that the naxalite movement uh, we we could find that Uh, many young people they joined the movement from the colleges and the university so many students they were being engaged they were not in a way happy with the kind of existing uh, politics or the policies which were being followed and their anger uh, 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 at the situation which was uh, in a way there at that point of time got reflected they were not happy with the prevailing uh, social condition and how they were in a way attracted by Uh, the radical naxalite slogans uh, and we find that uh, some of uh, the people like charu majumdar in 1969 as you can see on the screen as well uh, he was the communist party marxist leninist, leninist <coughs> cpi ml uh, so uh, that was formed under the leadership of uh, charu majumdar so that was that that was uh, another uh, split uh, in the uh, in the communist party of india which became the cpim uh, in 1964 and thereafter another split in 1969 when cpiml was also established as you can see on the screen that he played an important role how he was uh, associated uh, with the movement in a very close manner and uh, with the kind of vision which charu majumdar had uh, with regard to the movement which was to be carried out uh, at naxalbari uh, as well as the other centers and uh, we find that uh, he uh, had earlier participated in the tibhaga movement before independence as well and uh, when he founded the communist party of india uh, cpi ml and he also believed in the maoist path of peasant rebellion and he uh, defended the revolutionary violence and he finally died in police custody so uh, that was the time span uh, from 1918 to 1918 1972 
of Charu Mazumdar, who was a revolutionary leader, and uh, how he was closely associated uh, with the Naxal Bari uprising as well. So, uh, we find that uh, such uh, kind of leaders, those who had uh, belief in the Maoist path of uh, the peasant rebellion, and they were also ready uh, to undertake any kind of revolutionary violence. So, they carried on uh, the movement and how uh, we also find that he did not meet a good end when he died in the police custody. And thereafter, uh, uh, we find that uh, after some time, the movement also uh, petered out. And uh, when we also uh, tend to understand that how uh, the parties like CP, ML, Communist Party, Marxist, Leninist, uh, functioned and uh, how the other uh, Nexilite groups which were uh, associated with CPML, they in a way uh, behaved or believed and how uh, they saw that in uh, when they saw democracy, they considered that uh, democracy was a sham in India and Indian state was fascist in nature. Um, agrarian relations in India were still basically feudal and Indian big bourgeoisie was comprador. So, these were the kind of ideas uh, which were there uh, of uh, CP ML and other Nexilite groups and uh, they believed that how the Indian state it had to become more democratic in nature and whatever democracy which was there in India uh, was a sham and uh, they wanted to change the feudal uh, relations which were there in the uh, Indian society, because they considered that the in the relations in the Indian uh, society were still uh, feudal. And uh, they also felt in a way that how the uh, big uh, countries like US, British or the capitalist countries, uh, the, they were trying to dominate India. And uh, so, the, any kind of an imperialism or the capitalist ideas, they, they were to be negated and uh, they also felt that Indian polity and uh, economy, they were largely colonial in nature and Indian revolution was still in its anti-imperialist, anti-feudal stage and uh, uh, they in a way uh, wanted that such kind of a change was necessary in India. And uh, we also find that uh, the Nexilite groups, they got political and ideological support from the Chinese government, uh, which frowned upon CPML slogan of China's chairman Mao Zedong is our chairman. And CPML and other Nexilite groups, they succeeded in organizing armed peasant bands in some rural areas and in attacking the policemen and rival communists as agents of uh, the ruling classes. So, uh, we find that when uh, such kind of violent revolution was initiated, then uh, government was successful in terms of suppressing this movement and how the movement was limited uh, to a few pockets in the country and how uh, next slides they split into several splinter groups and factions. And we find that when we tend to understand the kind of issues which were there, then we find that uh, their failure was there uh, in terms of their inability to root their radicalism in the Indian reality. They had to understand the Indian reality, they had to grasp the character of the Indian society and polity uh, as also evolving agrarian st structure. And they had also to widen their social base among the peasants and the radical middle class youth. And uh, uh, their disowal of the cultural revolution and the Maoism of 1960s and early 70s uh, by post Mao Chinese leadership in late uh, 70s contributed further to the collapse of the Nexalite movement as a significant trend in the Indian politics. And uh, we find that uh, it in a way peasant uprising continued in 1967 uh, 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 continuing until about 1972 and it gave rise to spontaneous structural responses all over the country where youth with intellect and courage uh, 
they also joined the movement at different places and how youth was uh, also mobilized. And uh, so, that kind of a mobilization happened and in the context of uh, this kind of a mobilization, mobilization and the use of the violence here, uh, we find that uh, uh, this was also reflected in the culture where uh, film there was a book uh, by Jhumpa Lahiri Lowland. It also tries to portray uh, the kind of setup of uh, the Naxal Bari movement and films like Sudhir Mishra's Hazaro Khwaisha Aisi where uh, students from uh, the various universities and how K. K. Menon is being shown as a student of Delhi University and he decides to uh, leave his life of luxury to move to a village in Bihar. Uh, to fight the oppressive tendencies of upper caste landlords. So, this uh, kind of uh, depiction in the culture uh, in a, another film called Hazar Chaurasi Ki Ma, uh, where this film uh, was by, made by Govind Nihlani is, and is based on Mahashweta Devi's Bengali's novel Hazar Chaurasi Ma, and how it depicts the life of a woman who loses her son who was an exilite to violence that is a result of his adopted ideology and how she wants to understand that why his son uh, uh, in a way adopted those kinds of ideas. And Jaya Bachchan played an important uh, the, uh, the female protagonist role who tries to understand uh, uh, the way her son was trying to adopt that kind of uh, ideology. And then there is Naxal Bari series. Uh, which is also set in Maharashtra that is also uh, being shown and which became uh, quite popular. So, we find that these kind of reflections they were uh, there at the level of culture as well and we find that how various kinds of movements in different places uh, especially in 70s, 80s, 90s uh, in Bihar or Telangana they are also attributed uh, in a way to the kind of movement which was initiated at Naxal Bari. And uh, we also find that mm, that how uh, security forces they are told to be on high alert on May 25 every year which is being celebrated as the Naxal Bari day uh, in the forest of Bastar. So, uh, when we tend to understand uh, the reverberations of the uh, Naxal Bari movement and how the uh, Naxal Bari could be seen in the later times uh, in, in the context of uh, the Naxalite movement as well. So, with this I would like to end the discussion. Thank you very much.